dans ce deuxième épisode d'Objectif Vegan. Objectif Vegan, c'est une émission de L214 qui est réalisée en collaboration avec la chaîne YouTube Le Post du collectif Les Parasites. C'est diffusé sur Facebook et sur YouTube. Et c'est une émission qui, vous le savez, s'intéresse à des acteurs clés du mouvement pour les animaux. Et ce soir, nous recevons quelqu'un qui est un acteur majeur, euh, qui est l'auteur d'un livre qui a influencé une quantité considérable de personnes et de militants à travers le monde depuis une quarantaine d'années. C'est un livre qui est considéré comme... Euh, qui compte parmi les 100 plus importants ouvrages écrits ces 100 dernières années. C'est un classement euh, de Time Magazine. Et ce livre, vous l'avez reconnu sans doute, c'est « Animal Liberation, la libération animale » de Peter Singer, que nous recevons ce soir. Peter Singer oblige, l'émission sera donc en anglais. On va faire cet entretien en anglais et il va y avoir des sous-titres qui vont apparaître sous l'écran à partir de maintenant. Peter Singer, hello. Hi. Welcome to Paris. Thank you. And, nice uh, to be here. The French weather. Yes, yes. It could be a little sunnier, but I'll cope. Yeah. So thank you for um, accepting this interview. Uh, it's a great honor for us, for L214, to have this conversation with you about some um, animal issues and ethics. So to introduce you to a French audience, you are an Australian philosopher, a professor of bioethics at the University of Princeton, um, laureate professor at the Center for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics at the University of Melbourne, Yes, uh, the Centre for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics actually ran out of money, so oh dear. I'm now a professor <laughs> okay. in the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies. Okay, and Melbourne is your, well, it's Australia, so it's your home country? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I was explaining in French, you are also the author, uh, amongst many books, of Animal Liberation that was published in 1975. Right. And it's a book that has had a huge influence on many people around the world um, and that, that has turned the, the attention of many people towards uh, the condition of animals and certainly a, a book which has been very important for us at L214 as, uh, as activists. And uh, the first set of questions goes back a bit in history at mm -hmm. the time where, when you wrote that book. Right. Um, could you tell us how you came to get interested in animal issues, um, how the idea of that book came. Um, you were in Oxford, I believe. I was a graduate student at Oxford in 1970. Uh, so I was 24 years old at this time. And this is hard to believe nowadays, but um, I had never really met a vegetarian as far as I know. Um, and if I had, it might have been an Indian who was vegetarian because of Hindu beliefs. Uh, possibly there was somebody who had what I would have definitely thought of as sort of pretty cranky health beliefs. But um, in uh, that year, 1970, I just happened to meet a Canadian graduate student called Richard Keshin, and uh, we went for lunch at his college. and. Uh, At that time, there were only two things you could have for lunch. This was at Balliol College, Oxford, which was uh, a salad plate or a spaghetti plate with some brown sauce on it. And Richard asked if the brown sauce had meat in it, and when he was told that it did, he took the salad. Um, so I took the spaghetti, and we were talking about something completely different, but after a while, I asked him what his problem was with meat. Uh, and you know, he didn't come out with some cranky health theory or Hindu beliefs or anything like that. Um, but he said something much simpler that he didn't think it was right to treat the animals the way that they get treated in order to be turned into meat. Uh, and you know, here I was, I was studying philosophy and I was particularly interested in ethics and that point of view had never really occurred to me. Um, that might seem very strange, I know, but you, you have to think, firstly, that at that time it was just automatically assumed that issues about animals were much less serious, perhaps not serious at all, as compared to any issues about humans. Secondly, that I had no idea that many of the animals I was eating had, were no longer out in the fields, that they had been brought inside into the factory farms that were already uh, 
in existence. Um, and uh, so I suppose I assumed that animals, actually farmed animals, had nice lives. Um, although, of course, in the end they got slaughtered. I, I wasn't stupid, I knew that. Um, but uh, the idea that, um, firstly, they were suffering for most of their lives, so that was new to me, that's a sort of factual belief, but then also where that should fit into my ethical framework was something I hadn't really thought about until that day. Um, but I did start thinking about it and talking to Richard and a couple of other Canadian friends, uh, also students that he knew there, and talking to my wife who'd come to Oxford with me. Uh, and eventually we decided we would stop eating animals. So that was the first step. And then gradually over a much longer period, I began to look at this, to read what other philosophers had said about it, which was almost nothing in terms of contemporary philosophers. You know, you could, you could go back and see what some of the philosophers like Aristotle or Kant had said about animals, always negative, um, but it was hard to find much positive that philosophers had said. Uh, so then I started thinking, well, this really is an important issue um, that nobody is thinking about or talking about, and I should really try to write something and do something about it. So that was the, the germ of, of writing Animal Liberation. Mm. Um, in that book, one of the key ideas is the notion of uh, speciesism as a discrimination. Right. Um, what is it exactly? So speciesism is a term that I, I should say I did not invent. It was invented by Richard Ryder, who was another friend of these people that I, I met in Oxford, uh, and who was a psychologist who was concerned about what was done to animals in laboratories, experiments. And, and he published a little leaflet with a picture of a chimpanzee uh, who had been deliberately infected with syphilis, um, looking very sad and ill. And he put the heading, the term speciesism, above this. And I immediately responded to that because, uh, of course, I was opposed to racism. Uh, people were starting to talk about sexism uh, at that time. Uh, and he was, it conveyed the idea that just as racists treat their own race as somehow morally superior to the others and put others at a lower level and uh, male chauvinists put women at a lower level to theirs, so we as a whole, as, as a species, were putting other species at an inferior moral status to us. And I'd been doing that um, right up until just before that moment. So I could see that this was a good way of presenting it. Um, you know, I didn't know, none of my friends were racists, um, at least, you know, would not accept that they were racists. Similarly, they would deny that they were sexist, but none of them, you know, would have denied that they were speciesists, really. They would all have agreed, yes, we humans are superior and we don't owe moral duties to animals, or if we do, they're far less important. And um, in reaction to speciesism, you, um, you, you defend the idea of equality of consideration of interests and, um, and you write a lot about sentience and how sentience is an important moral criteria um, as opposed to rationality, for instance, or uh, the, the ability of um, reaching an agreement uh, involving rights and duties in return. Um, does the equal consideration of interests imply equality of rights? And, and, what, is, and what, do, what does sentience mean? Right, um, so uh, to give a short answer to your specific question, uh, equal consideration of interests doesn't imply equality of rights. Um, one, reason, one way of seeing that is that certain rights depend on some capacities. So we could have equal consideration of my interests and the interests of a non-human animal, like a horse or a dog or a pig. And that would mean that if something was going to cause pain to the horse or dog or pig of a comparable kind to something that was going to cause pain to me, they would be equally bad. We shouldn't say the pain to me really matters and the pain to the horse and dog and pig doesn't matter. If the pain is just as severe, just as acute for them, then it matters just as much. But that doesn't mean that I have the same rights as horses and dogs and pigs. For example, uh, I, sh I have a right to vote. I believe that we should have a system where everybody has some say in how they're governed. 
but that requires you to be capable of making choices as to who might govern you to understand the issues. Um, I don't think a horse or a dog or a pig can do that. Uh, so there are a whole set of rights that humans have that are dependent on their capacities. You could say there might be some basic rights. If you think there are rights that all humans have, including the newborn infant, including the profoundly brain damaged human, then I think you would have to say that those rights should also be shared by non-human animals with similar capacities and the capacity to feel. Like the right to live, for instance. Right, that's right, yes. So you might think that you know, the wrongness of killing a being does to some extent depend on that being's capacities to plan their own life, to have wishes and desires for the future, to think about that. Um, that that's somehow a greater tragedy if someone is killed prematurely before they can carry out their plans than if a being has no sense of planning for the future or thinking about, you know, what will I be doing in some future times? What do I want to do? So depending on, perhaps depending on those capacities, we might think the right to life is not equally strong or equally valid for all sentient creatures. Okay, yeah. And um, so you are well known for being a utilitarian f f philosopher, excuse me. Yes. And, um, um, can you explain what that means exactly? When did utilitarianism appear as a movement? Um, in what context? Who, who were the first utilitarian philosophers? And maybe who are, uh, apart from yourself, are there any still today? Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so generally speaking, people date utilitarianism from the work of Jeremy Bentham in the late 18th and early 19th century. Uh, there were predecessors who were not so explicit about what they were doing, but you can see them as part of that tradition, including David Hume, perhaps. Um, but uh, uh, so, yes, uh, then you had Bentham, then you had John Stuart Mill in the 19th century, and other thinkers going through into the 20th uh, century and, and into today. That's, that's the tradition which is particularly strong in English-speaking countries, but is also, for example, quite strong in Sweden. Um, and uh, I think you can see utilitarian tendencies in thinking in Asia as well. There's an ancient Chinese philosopher called Mo Tsi. Um, we don't have a lot of his writings, but he seems to have been what we would now call a utilitarian. Uh, as for your question, are there other utilitarian philosophers today? The answer is yes, lots of them. Um, uh, it depends a little how exactly, how precisely you define the term, but uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of philosophers who broadly would say, as utilitarians do, the right action is the one that has the best consequences. So that's the, sort of the key idea, that right and wrong depend on the consequences of your actions. Okay. Now, utilitarians say the important consequences are those that uh, are related to happiness and misery, to, to well-being, in other words, we might say. Some, cons some philosophers might say, I'm a consequentialist but not a utilitarian, so I think the right action depends on its consequences, but I take into account a wider range of consequences. So I take account of, I don't know, knowledge or freedom or autonomy. These might be independent goods, uh, not just happiness. Okay. So every case has to be examined. Uh, you, you, you can't really follow some principles like not, do not lie or do not kill or... Uh, certainly not, absolutely. No, you might no. say in everyday life, of course, yes, you know, if someone answers, asks you, you know, do you know the way to the Champs-Élysées um, and you do, then you would normally, without thinking, you would just tell them the truth, right? Um, but... Uh, but um, it's not an absolute rule. And I think most people actually would agree on, on this particular case about lying. Most people would agree that uh, there are some cases where it's right to lie, where um, you know, you're trying to prevent some disaster. Uh, you know, the, the person who is asking you the way is actually a terrorist who's wanting to, to kill people. Then uh, obviously you lie and tell him it's where the police station is or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, everybody would agree, I think that's the right thing to do. Um, so, but utilitarians, yes, they would think that um, 
in general, in everyday life, there are certain rules and principles that you can adopt. We call them like rules of thumb, just general guides. But um, in exceptional circumstances, there is no rule that you might not be justified in breaking. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so you are currently in France to talk about um, the translation in French of your book on Henry Spira. Right. Um, the, the French translation goes, I don't know if you, well, I guess you've seen it, oh, yes. La théorie du tube de dentifrice, the, the toothpaste theory. Um, and you wrote that book some years ago. Yes, about already. 20 years yeah. ago now uh -huh. in English. Um, and I'm delighted that it's in French and that it is uh, attracting a, a lot of interest and a wide audience. Um, I think it's probably going to do better in France than it did in English, which is, which is interesting. Oh, um, uh, although the English publisher or the American publisher is now thinking of putting out a new edition of it, uh, okay. partly because of the reaction that it's already received in France. Yeah. Oh, cool. That's nice. Yeah. Um, so, um, so Henry Spira is someone that was important to us at L214 when we founded the organization some 10 years ago. We were very influenced by his um, his methods and mm -hmm. his, um, his tactics. Would you say he was a u utilitarian? Or he had a pragmatic approach. Uh, yes. <coughs> I mean, Henry used to say that what motivated him was siding with the oppressed and people who, or beings who were suffering. Um, he sometimes talked about the vast universe of suffering that we inflict on animals, and he wanted to reduce that universe of suffering. That was, I guess, his overriding aim. So some people would refer to that as negative utilitarianism. He's really concerned about reducing suffering. He's not so concerned about promoting happiness, um, but it's the negative side of it. And I think that's, that's, that is, in fact, pragmatically something that I would endorse. That is, even though I do think it would be good to promote happiness, but in practice, we can do a lot more good by focusing on reducing suffering. Mm. And how could you introduce him to, 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 to a French audience? What, 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 what kind of person was he? Well, Henry was a remarkable person, and maybe let me just talk a little bit about how I first met him. Yeah. Um, I was writing Animal Liberation when I was in New York. I, for a time, I was a visiting, had a visiting position at New York University. And I decided to give an adult education class on the ideas of animal liberation. Uh, I had it in draft and I would go through the, some of the drafts and share it with people and get their reaction and response before completing the work. So we had this class of, I don't know, maybe 15, 20, perhaps 25 people turned up. Um, obviously people who had some interest in animals and concern for animals. Um, majority of them women, um, majority of them you know, educated and uh, nicely spoken and neat dressed in appearance. And then there was this guy who walked in who was, you know, had, was wearing shoelaces that were shoes without shoelaces or they were not done up, um, which was not the fashion then. Um, a sort of open necked uh, shirt, um, untucked as well, also not the fashion then. Uh, very rumpled hair. And when he spoke, it was like uh, an accent that came somewhere off the, off the uh, automobile assembly line in New Jersey, where he had in fact worked for a time. Uh, it was not at all an educated way of speaking. Um, but here he was um, talking about animals or come to listening about animals. And um, you know, I sort of said, so what brought you here? And he said, well, all my life I've been on the side of the oppressed. I've been on the side of the, the weak. I, you know, when the civil rights movement broke out, I went to the South and I marched with alongside African-Americans for their civil rights. When the revolution in Cuba broke out, I went to see if I could assist in some way to get the landless peasants uh, better conditions, which he believed was, was happening there. Uh, when I worked as a merchant seaman and the corrupt union was in cahoots with the bosses selling out the seamen, I joined a reform movement. So I've always been on the side of the oppressed, and now I realize that actually the most oppressed group of all are animals. They're the ones who really have no voice and who we can just tread down and exploit as ruthlessly as we like. So um, I want to 
I want to think more about this and maybe whether there's something that I can do about this. Okay, so it, it was a, an extension of, of, of the concern that he had for social issues or... Exactly, he's right. someone who'd always been on the left. In fact, he'd spent a number of years as a member of the Trotskyist uh, party, the Socialist Workers' Party, um, before he realised that actually they were kind of living in a bubble and had no idea what was going on in the world. Um, but uh, uh, he'd always considered himself part of the left and uh, on the side of the oppressed. And uh, you know, it was more or less, well, there were actually two things came together that brought him along on that occasion. One is that he read an article in a leftist magazine that was ridiculing uh, something that I had published in the New York Review of Books. That was the first thing I published on animals before I published Animal Liberation, um, uh, which was about essentially the ideas of animal liberation. And this was ridiculed in a left-wing journal as kind of, you know, the latest bourgeois frivolities, right? Mm -hmm. And he could see through that criticism, although he was of the left and he was buying, reading that magazine because generally he agreed with it. He thought, ah, maybe there actually is something in this. It's not so silly. And the second thing that happened was that he had a friend who had a cat who decided to go overseas and said, hey, Henry, you look after my cat. Um, and he'd never had, you know, pets or companion animals before. But I have to say, the cat did a good job of charming him. Um, and, and he said, he told me later, you know, one day he had this epiphany. Um, here he was petting one animal and sticking a knife and fork into another. And he thought that maybe there's something wrong with doing that. Um, so that's what brought him to that uh, course, that adult education course. Okay, so it's, it's a bit like what's happening to... Raphael Glucksmann at the moment. <laughs> yes, <he's, laughs> yes, although he's, he was influenced more by Descartes, I think, in, in the wrong way at first, and is breaking away from the Cartesian and Kantian influences. I don't think Henry was ever influenced by Descartes. Um, what does the um, metaphor of the toothpaste uh, stand for? Uh, well, it's a very nice title, I think. It's a much better title than I gave the English book, I have to say, which I called Ethics into Action. A bit of a boring title. Um, so Henry says somewhere in the book that if you want to get change, let's say you want to get a corporation like Revlon to stop testing its cosmetics on animals, which it was doing, and that was one of Henry's uh, important early campaigns. Uh, so how do you get Revlon to change? Well, it's like getting, tube, it's, it's like getting toothpaste out of a blocked tube, right? There's two things that matter. One is how bad is the blockage? And secondly, how much pressure can you put on the tube, on the bottom of the tube to get the toothpaste out? Well, Henry realized that if the blockage is really bad, no matter how much pressure you put on the bottom, you're not going to get any toothpaste out. So although he had these documents showing that Revlon was performing horrible experiments on, on rabbits, putting these chemicals directly into the eyes of unanesthetized rabbits, which caused the eyeballs and eyes to just burn. Um, nevertheless, if he'd said to Revlon, you have to stop testing your products on animals, that would have been like an Im unremovable blockage because the US government regulations required new products to be tested on animals. And Revlon was never going to say, okay, we'll stop producing any new products. Right? The company can't do that. So he thought, well, how can we make the blockage one which we could get some toothpaste through? And his answer to that was, let's instead ask Revlon to put some money into developing an alternative to the use of animals. Because he, he, he talked to some scientists in the area and they said, yes, it's realistic to think that you could test these products on cell cultures, you know, uh, just cells in, 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 a, in vitro. Um, so he asked Revlon instead to give one-tenth of one percent of its revenues towards developing an alternative to animal experimentation. Um, and then, of course, he still had to put some pressure on them because when he first went there and said this would be a good idea to do, they sort of said, well, who are you? You know, you're one rumpled-haired guy walking in off the street. Why should we listen to you? With no shoelaces. With no shoelaces, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so he was able to get... Uh, enough people together to make public protests, to um, get media involved in, in those protests, uh, uh, to run an ad in the New York Times with pictures of rabbits and showing 
how many rabbits does Revlon have to blind for beauty's sake? So Revlon started to feel the pressure. They started to see that this could hurt their image. They have a, uh, an image of a company that is devoted to beauty, not a company that is devoted to blinding rabbits. So um, that was the pressure, and, and that's the metaphor. You, know? you succeed in getting something out of Revlon by making it possible to pass the blockage and putting enough pressure to do that. Um, yeah. Um, I was thinking in, in France, it's very difficult to obtain um, improvements through the law mm -hmm. um, because, um, because the parliament is under the influence of many lobbies, as in many countries, I, I suppose. Uh, the hunters, uh, the meat industry, uh, the, the cosmetic industry. Um, how do you think Hen Henry Spiro would, would tackle that problem? Well, Henry didn't, didn't really launch any major campaigns to change the law. Um, as with the example of, of Revlon, he launched a campaign to get Revlon to develop alternatives. And then, you know, once he'd succeeded with Revlon, he then went to Avon and Bristol-Myers and L'Oreal and the others and said, well, you've seen what Revlon have done. And, of course, they had, and they'd seen why Revlon had done it. So how about you also joining? So he got together quite a large pool of money for developing alternatives. And you know, the, the law was not, well, the law had to be changed, I guess, for once the alternatives had been validated for the Food and Drug Administration to say, you don't have to do animal experiments. This is a, a valid alternative. But that didn't have to go through Congress. That was just an administrative <laughs> regulation. So Henry never really lobbied Congress to passed different laws. His view was that that was kind of a, a morass that you could walk into, put a lot of energy into and just sink down and not achieve anything. So he really tried to do things in other ways. Okay. Now that, that's not to say that you know in other circumstances with a different political system he would have said don't try politics there. Mm. Uh, but it would all depend on, on the chances that he would have of success how much energy you would have to invest in that, what other possibilities there were. You know, maybe you could uh, change these practices in other ways by getting consumers to boycott the products that um, uh, cause so much suffering to animals. And, and maybe if Parliament sees that the consumers are boycotting the products and the meat industry sees that, then actually they'll want to change because they don't want people to be so disgusted with how they're treating animals that they will look for alternatives to meat. Okay, so he wouldn't bother with politics, really. He'd, he'd, he'd go and deal directly with the industry and, he, and use public opinion as, a, as pressure. Yes, that's yeah. right. Certainly in the United States, as I say. It, it would be different perhaps in different countries, but in the United States he just thought the political system is so corrupt, so influenced by lobbyists, that um, it's better to look for other ways of bringing about change. Okay. And so he, you, you told us he was a... Left-wing activists. Yes. Can we say that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, fighting for the rights of um, of workers of w of women. Would you say that um, the concerns for animals and the concern for human issues go hand in hand? They certainly did with with Henry. They were concerned for the weak and defenceless and oppressed. And uh, once Henry realised that animals fell into that category, then uh, he thought that was an important issue that she, she should work on. And I think there are a lot of others who actually also have that idea. For instance, um, so the, the Frenchman that I know who's supportive of these issues is, is Mathieu Ricard, who comes from a, a Buddhist viewpoint of compassion for all sentient beings. So he's very concerned about altruism in, in general. He's written a big book about altruism. He has an organization uh, that helps people in uh, Tibet and Nepal, I think, uh, people in poverty. Um, and he's very concerned about animals as well. So I think there, from a number of different perspectives, uh, this concern for reducing suffering and, and helping the weak and helpless um, bring animal and human issues together. Thank you. Um, back to nowadays, um, from a utilitarian point of view, what would you say are the issues that um, animal rights organizations should be focusing on right now? 
Well, utilitarians will always be concerned, as I said, about the consequences. And so you will look for where is the most suffering being inflicted on animals. Um, and that is, is not going to be, in my view, dogs and cats, although certainly there are some abused dogs and cats, and people are very concerned about dogs and cats. But compared to the number of animals suffering in factory farms, uh, leading much worse lives than most dogs and cats, uh, that, you know, the number of abused dogs and cats is really quite small. So I think we need to focus on the areas where the most suffering is, and, and that is generally animals raised for food, particularly animals raised in factory farms. And I think we need to try to get the public to boycott um, those products uh, as far as possible and to, uh, if we can't do that, then to try to get step-by-step -step incrementally better conditions for the animals living inside those factory farms. And, um, yeah, and how can we contribute to that, not as an organisation but as a, as a simple citizen, as an individual? Well, of course, the first thing you can mm -hmm. do is to think about what you're buying. Um, how are you spending your euros? Because that's a kind of voting. Um, and if, if enough consumers continue to buy factory farm products, we can be pretty confident that factory farm products will continue to be produced. But on the other hand, if uh, more consumers boycott factory farm products, then there'll be less revenue for the lobbying industries. There'll be fewer customers. The supermarkets will reduce their orders of factory farm products. So um, that's the first step as a consumer. Now, of course, I think the, the best step is to try to avoid animal products altogether if you can. Um, and there are many new products coming on the market now that uh, are plant-based or not coming from sentient beings. And I encourage those, those developments. I think they're getting better and better. And they certainly will have a role to play in reducing consumption of, of uh, animal products. But um, but even if you say, well, I'm, you know, I'm not prepared to go vegan, but um, I will make sure that if I buy animal products, uh, they've come from animals who have good lives, and I will really check up on that. You know, that's, that's a step in the right direction. Um, I, don't, I don't condemn people who feel that they can't move immediately to being a vegan. If they can, that's great, and it's been wonderful to see more and more people doing that in the last few years, so it's got easier. But... Um, I think we want to encourage everybody to keep moving in the right direction as you know, whatever steps they can take, we should praise them for it, not condemn them. Yeah. Would you say um, during the last 40 years, I mean, since you wrote Animal Liberation, would you say this, the situation has improved or got worse? It's, well, um, if you're talking about the situation in France or in Europe generally or in Europe and the United States and Australia, it's definitely improved. We've had significant reforms. And uh, I mean, if you look at the 1975 edition of Animal Liberation, um, the things that I focus mostly on is the worst forms of factory farming, uh, individual stalls for veal calves, individual stalls for uh, sows, for the breeding mother pigs, and the battery cage for hens, which at that stage were tiny wire cages about this big by this big that might hold four or five hens. Now, all three of those methods of keeping animals have been prohibited in the entire European Union. Um, and I'm not saying that they've been replaced by, you know, ideal conditions at all, but uh, that's still significant progress. I think the animals have better lives because those means of keeping them have gone in the European Union. So yes, I think that's significant progress. But also, in the last uh, five to ten years, uh, we've been having this upsurge of uh, vegan foods, vegan eating, vegan restaurants. Um, and that's been really interesting to see how for many, peop many people are now prepared to take this step. I mean, when, when I started thinking about this uh, 45 years ago, nobody knew what the term vegan meant. Um, you know, if you'd said to people, I like vegan food, they would have said, what? Um, so uh, I think that's an important change. It's a great change in awareness and it's a great change in availability of uh, alternatives to animal foods. But you were 
talking of the Western word, but world, basically. Yes, yeah. the, 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 <clears throat> the downside is that as countries like China have become more prosperous, um, people are able to afford meat, which they always looked up to as something that only the rich people could eat, and now they're earning more money so they can afford to buy meat and China has implemented vast numbers of factory farms so they can afford to buy this. And uh, that's a tragedy for animals, it's a tragedy for the planet and the environment um, and it's a tragedy for Chinese as well who I think will, if they start increasing, well they are increasing but if they reach anything like Western levels of meat consumption they'll find there are serious health consequences as well. So I think it's really important uh, for us to try to encourage the development of Chinese animal welfare or animal rights organizations that will try to work within China to make people more aware of factory farming and uh, what that means and get them to move away from it. And you were mentioning uh, the development of alternatives to, to meet uh, plant-based alternatives and you also mentioned uh, alternatives coming not coming from sentient beings right, that's I, right. I, I suppose you were thinking of clean meat yes yeah? that's right mm -hmm. so there's two different strategies to try to replace meat that comes from animals capable of suffering one is to produce plant-based uh, products that have the same taste and chewy texture uh, and that can be cooked in similar ways as as meat and there's a lot of progress with that being made there are much better plant-based burgers out now for example than they were five years ago um, there's a kind of a faux chicken pieces if you want sort of the white meat of chicken uh, there's a funny story that the american supermarket chain whole foods uh, for a time labeled its um, labeled its uh, false chicken as just chicken salad right without putting that it was false chicken fake chicken salad um, and that was on sale for about a month and no customers complained no customers who bought this product said oh, this isn't really chicken right? they just all accepted it yeah. um, and then Whole Foods eventually discovered they'd made this mistake so you know that shows that at least for something that is like white chicken meat um, we've already got very good plant-based alternatives. So that's, that's one thing, the plant-based alternatives. The other idea is, as you say, what is now being called clean meat, that is uh, starting off with the cell of an animal, of a cow let's say, and then producing, uh, getting that to multiply in a certain suitable environment, suitable fluid, so that you end up with uh, a quantity of meat, let's say the easiest would be hamburger style meat, uh, that you can make a burger of or um, whatever else you use hamburgers meat for uh, and that will replace that, that will not involve any animal suffering because it was never a sentient being and uh, that will be more environmentally friendly, it won't produce the methane that cows produce when they live and uh, that will also be economically competitive with, with meat. So, you know, some people think that's possible in a relatively short time frame, you know, five years, let's say. Um, might take longer to get things like steak or whatever, but it's in principle possible and people are investing money in companies that are trying to do this to um, find a way of replacing animal farming altogether. And if that succeeds, I think obviously it will make a, a huge difference to reduce the amount of suffering in the world. Okay. Does it raise any issues in terms of bioethics? Well, I, I, I think that it's, it would be acceptable to produce um, meat in that way. Of course, you could say, well, there's still an animal cell involved that comes from an animal, but you know, this, that could be used again and again. Um, the animal is not being harmed or probably the animal might well have died long before some of this is produced. Uh, so I don't see that as an ethical problem um, and if it is in fact environmentally friendly, if it doesn't have negative environmental outputs as, as raising animals does, <coughs> um, then the only remaining thing would be that it, because it is meat it would have the same health problems as meat. Um, so you know you might not want to eat it or might not want to eat much of it for that reason. 
But um, you know, that's a choice. I, I think people should be educated about the health issues of eating a lot of meat. But I, I don't think they should be compelled not to just for their own health. So in a way, I would ultimately leave that choice to the consumers. Okay. So an interesting p perspective for the future. I hope so. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Um, we're getting close to the end of the interview. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you if are there any issues or topics you are interested? I mean, apart from animal issues, uh, you are interested in at the moment. Uh, certainly, I'm um, been involved in in what's known as the effective altruism movement, which is a movement that is trying to encourage people to think about making the world a better place, but also to do it as effectively as possible to use your resources to the maximum effectiveness. Now that clearly can apply to the animal movement, and in fact we've been talking about how to make the animal movement as effective as possible. But it can also apply to problems like uh, global poverty, like reducing the number of people in extreme poverty in the world. It can apply to uh, mitigating the effects of climate change, um, which will harmfully affect both humans and animals. Uh, so those are certainly issues that I've been concerned with um, over the last few years and continue to be concerned with. Um, last question. Um, La théorie du tube de dentifrice is, is published by uh, La Goutte d'Or. Um, if you could re recommend um, to a French publisher two or three books um, for people who are interested in ethics in general to, to be translated in French, what, uh -huh. what could you suggest? <clears throat> well, it, it, it depends a little how philosophical they want to get in terms of their reading. Um, so uh, I think the Oxford philosopher Derek Parfit, who died uh, just uh, over a year ago, um, uh, has written uh, really important philosophical works that uh, uh, pro perhaps they already are in French, some of them, I don't know, but he wrote a book called Reasons and Persons that was published in the 1980s. And then he wrote, uh, well, what was initially two volumes, and now there's a third volume called On What Matters, um, which I think for people getting into fundamental ideas about ethics, uh, they uh, are very valuable works. But you know, although actually Parfit's style is very clear and simple and, and direct, but they're very complicated issues that he's talking about. Um, so, you know, that would be one example of a of a book that uh, people could read, but if you want uh, more uh, a book for a, a wider audience, um, so uh, there's a book written by an English, uh, f well he's actually American, but a philosopher working in England uh, called Leif Wenar, um, and it's called Blood Oil. Uh, it's about the resource curse, about the way in which by buying oil from dictators who don't uh, put any of the revenue into improving the situation of their country. We are creating a world in which we encourage corruption, we encourage violence, and we encourage, in fact, civil war to try to get, because we increase the incentive to take over a government, um, uh, stage a coup d'etat or a civil war, and then you can deal with all these Western oil companies and sell the oil of your country for large amounts of money. So um, I think that he's, he's trying to start a movement uh, that he's calling clean trade. So I think uh, Leif Wenar's Blood Oil would be a book that would be good to see in French as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That was a fantastic conversation. Great. Thanks thank again. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank good you. to talk to you.